is listen to people speak. And um, I've got to tell you a story. I reached out to the entire Ellen's Center. And the only two people that responded are, of course, the next chair of the Ellen's Center. <laughs> and a regained alternate, uh, Pat Ford. Um, how many of you have watched the um, LPTV? TV? Candidate Spotlight, the Philly Spotlight? I've So I've been on it a couple times. Um, I've been on your show. I've been on your show a couple times too. Oh, I, 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 I need to kind of drag it down. I know. Great guest. Yeah, yeah, I was a great guest. Um, I was the worst. We all know that. Pat has really helped bring the LP into the 21st century uh, from a media standpoint. Um, he managed New England media for the 2020 Joe Jorgensen campaign. Uh, he was uh, six years as state chair of Rhode Island, if I'm not mistaken, which I mean, what's that, like four people left there now? That was a false statement. I mean, that's all I can fit, really. Um, He's not Caitlin Clubin, he is Pat Ford. Representing the Libertarian Party, often in debate with other 
chairs, the state chairs of the Democratic and the Republican Party, on an equal footing. We were represented in newspapers, we were on television. The NBC affiliate, in response to a, a crisis with a proposed stadium, would actually send their camera crew to us. Literally on talk radio three or four times a week, sometimes to call in, sometimes as a guest. And of course, we also, as Chris mentioned, hosted our own meeting. The difference being, and this is what I'm begging all of you to do, and bear with me as we do this off the cuff, is that let's turn our homegrown media, and I love all our, I don't care if you're a podcaster in a garage, I don't care if you're someone who's got a nice studio set. You're all working on behalf of Liberty, and you all have a whole hell of a lot to say, and you never know who your efforts are going to reach in that battle to end the, the, the state. But let's take the opportunity to take that entire amazing apparatus that we've got nationally and turn that around and focus outward to the community. One of the most important points Chris made was people don't give a damn about economic professors. They don't care about Wall Street economics. We focus on the LPTV show constantly on local what we call lunch pail issues because that's what's going to get you votes. And you have the opportunity, and all of you are articulate enough and smart enough to reflect our libertarian philosophy, our statement of principles, our platform through normal day-to-day -day events. We're living in the middle of proof positive of everything that we have worked for as a community, in some cases for nearly 50 years. So let's harness that apparatus, if you will, and turn it outward. Now, and again, bear with me, so I'm, I'm kind of doing this off the top of my head. I didn't come with a lot of handouts. When you leave here, if you'd like, I'll give you my business card with my cell phone. I have spent nearly 15 plus years engaging with local media sources to get that kind of coverage. I am available not only just as your alternate region aide, not only as a former chairman, but as a fellow libertarian warrior all right, to offer you any assistance, input, contacts, advice, just simply a different perspective if possible at any time. That's how critical this is right now. So let's go through a couple of things here. What is, what is earned media? You know, there's lots of different media, and some of it is obvious, some of it is, is a little more nuanced. Uh, earned media is not just free stuff. That's critically important for a party that doesn't have the financial uh, assets, if you will, of the big two, right? It's important that we get as much free media as possible. But earned media is the combination, the culmination of your efforts as an affiliate to take your legislative testimony, your town council testimony, your, your standing out there and waving signs testimony, your support, for example, of controversial issues like the, uh, the ability to support sex work as real work and to promote sex worker rights by gearing, gearing together with actual sex worker rights organizations. So you can range from the apple pie, we support small government, we support fiscal responsibility, on its way through the entire libertarian spectrum, unabashedly, unapologetically, by harnessing your efforts. Very simply put, if you don't either A, video what you're doing, and or B, get it publicized through some sort of media. It didn't happen. It's that simple. It simply didn't happen. I've seen affiliates do some amazing jobs in testimony at town councils, local as it gets, on issues that are fundamental to what we believe in. And then leave it at that. You sat there in the meeting for three hours. You got marginalized. They waited intentionally until you were the last person there. Maybe some people were watching it on the local cable access. But it's our responsibility to film those efforts and then put them in a package that you can disseminate to local media. Again, you didn't film it, it doesn't get shared, it simply didn't happen. Why is earned media so important besides, besides the obvious that it's free? News organizations, even as disparaged as they are today, and or local community groups, disseminate that information. They love your speech so much, they put it up on their website. The local news picks it up because it's gone semi-viral. 
coming from a trusted independent source, people are much more likely to believe what you're saying if it's delivered by an organization that is not the Libertarian Party. That's nothing to do with the Libertarian Party, that's all organizations in general. There's an imprimatur, the approval, if you will, of the media, which still means a lot to a lot of people. We're seeing it on the news, it must be true. Oh my goodness, there's a Libertarian Party. There are multiple forms to deliver this in. Let's take the, the most basic. Who here has some type of libertarian, some type of talk radio culture in the community? Show hands. Are there local, local, local talk radio shows? Yeah. Okay. How many <coughs> folks have been designated by the local affiliate to actually broadcast and or make calls and calls on behalf of the Libertarian Party on those shows? Anyone? Besides Spike. <coughs> Spike can't be on a local, as much as he's in everywhere, he can't be the voice on every local news show that's talking about, and I'll tell you the I ran into this week. I've been on the Envision show one time. That's right. You were on the WRKL. I, I, I hosted for you once. You hosted for you once. And we turned the entire hour to a discussion. AM 68, AM 680. Right, we turned the entire hour to a discussion on sex worker rights. 290,000 listeners. Right, there you go. You need to take your, let me put it this way. You've got folks listening, in many cases, anywhere from the hundreds to tens of thousands of people listening to that show. Depending on that show's rules, you may have the ability to call in two or three times a week on setting issues. This week in Rhode Island, one of the hot button issues was noise limitations on ATVs in a rural community. So I went to the town council meeting. Standing room only. You want to talk about what was being viewed as an attack on the individual freedom of people who lived in that rather country by part of Rhode Island who had moved to that part of Rhode Island specifically so they could engage in those type of activities? Holy cow. And amazingly enough, I'm standing there, I'm taking this, and I'm listening to people talk about why can't, why does government have to get involved in noise levels? Can't we just as neighbors talk to each other? Mm -hmm. I almost passed out. Rhode Island is the bluest state in America. Rhode Island makes New York look like Utah, just to put it in perspective. So those sadly weren't libertarian activists doing that. But imagine if you were in that position where on talk radio, that's a local sentient issue. Imagine if you go to the town council meeting as a libertarian activist and you make a speech on behalf of the community's right to peacefully engage in those types of activities and to work out differences with your neighbors on a one-to-one -one basis. As my predecessor here at the show today, say that's libertarian AF, right? Our as fuck. Right. <laughs> so libertarian as fuck. Now, if you would engage in that as a community, you would see all of a sudden people look at you in a completely different perspective. But face it, maybe 40 or 50 people in that meeting, maybe 70, maybe 100. How does that scale? On the other hand, if you had taken that video, made a presentation of it, and then submitted it electronically to a variety of news sources in, in, in that media area who are also well aware of what, how important that is in that community and how that has the potential to drive clicks, send people to your website because they might see it themselves or they want to rehear your speech time and time again. If you don't do that, yeah, okay, people in town, there's a handful of people in town who care about their site. But again, you don't get an opportunity to, re, if you will, to grow that message amongst the community. So we need to, as a party, recognize those opportunities. And it can be as something as relatively not confrontational as decibel levels because of ATVs, or it can be something a little bit more personal. It can be something a little bit more, if you will, topical national. Which is, of course, we're talking about back in the day, which we as a party. Somebody's got to say something somewhere, right? We've got a situation in Rhode Island where private care health care workers, a, a mandate was issued on them which resulted in their dismissal from their work. These are people who, like many of your communities, who had worked throughout the pandemic, putting themselves at risk, wearing trash bags as, as PPE. We all know about the PPE now, right? These people were summarily dismissed. 
Yet the state workers are constantly being given reprieves. This is happening all over America. And incredibly enough, organizations are popping up across America. One of them in the Northeast is an organization called CORE, kind of Trumpy, but they're speaking to those issues. Well, we're not. And if we are, no one knows about it. And yet these people are turning out thousands and thousands of people at that rally. I'm going to one tomorrow in Boston. All right? Thousands of people at rallies who are clearly now politically motivated and activated. And as a party, I don't know if we're really capturing this. How do we do it? So talk radio is a perfect example. You get an opportunity sometimes 30 to 45 seconds 60 seconds, maybe, a minute and a half. How do we as libertarians prepare for that? Opportunity and responsibility. If you're calling in and you're identifying yourself as an officer of a libertarian affiliate, you need to make sure that your points are, in, if you will, uh, in concordance with what your local affiliate, how they believe. You need to be responsible in your speech. We as libertarians abhor violence. So we don't allude to violence or whatever. The benefit is twofold. Number one, thousands of people are listening to you. You get the opportunity to plug not only your viewpoint, but you also get the opportunity to plug an event that's coming up. You get an opportunity to plug your website. Just as importantly, talk radio is a wonderful way for people to train to deliver their message in a short, succinct, on-point manner. You got a minute and a half. If you start babbling, boom. Hang right up on me. That doesn't work, does it? Now, fortunately, I was going to show you, we were going to, I was going to focus a little bit on press releases as well. So you've got Libertarian Party people calling talk radio. How do you then harness the news operations that exist within those radio stations and also you know, news stations elsewhere, both print and video? And the press release is the key. Now, like I said, I'd love to display it, but ultimately, a well-written press release, and I'll put this up for people if they want to grab the videos and everything I was going to show, but a well-written press release includes who, what, when, where, and why. Critical. The who, what, when, and where, and why, who obviously is the Libertarian Party affiliate. With, are you ready for this? It's going to get crazy here, a phone number. Imagine a phone number, a modern telephone communication device invented a century ago that we seem to ignore as Libertarians. Because people may want to actually call you to discuss attending your event. They're probably not going to email you. The current state of a newsroom and a news editor is such that they are responding to the easiest, newsiest, most potential for click source around. That's what they're looking to identify. You have to make it easy to contact. But where? Critical point. <laughs> The where should always be, if ever possible, at a place where other newsmakers and potentially other people who cover the news are going to be. Newsletter. You probably aren't going to show up the first couple times just for your event, at your location, at somebody's home or backyard, or at some libertarian friendly business somewhere. The most successful press event I ever ran. Actually, it was a few years ago. It was an attempt by the state to garner a $100 million subsidy for a baseball game. Taxpayer money going to support a private entertainment facility. Great stuff. No problems there. So we organized a coalition, there we go, that coalition thing again, of 11 different political organizations. I spoke on behalf of the Libertarian Party. I was acknowledged as the organizer. We held it at the state's Commerce Corporation, the Office of Economic Development. The afternoon that the Boston Red Sox we're driving down to present their vision of this new stadium. The media was sitting there doing this. They were bored. We, one of our libertarians, has a punk rock band, we bought a hella PA system, Jimmy Dope at the door, plugged it in, and people started making speeches. Providence and Boston media picked it up. We limited the speech to three minutes for everyone. Literally, we had progressive, we had a, the head of the Tea Party citing the failure of the states to provide for single moms and while simultaneously providing money for corporate welfare. 
That was the kind of kumbaya moment it was. And it was live on TV. Not because of it, uh, they were that attracted to us, but they were sitting there and literally just turned the cameras on. Incredibly enough, the governor of the state of Rhode Island, halfway through the presentation with the Boston Red Sox, issued a press release that said she did not support the current implementation and business plan and that the Boston Red Sox needed to go back. Go back to the drawing board. Oh, we got something, everybody? Maybe. We'll see. Okay. You hang on to that. All right. Thank you. Actually, what I want. I'm not promising it. True story. She pulled the plug on a $100 million subsidy. Why? Because Libertarians organized an event, included a coalition of virtually every political organization, and did it live on cameras in Fox 25 in Boston were playing. Because I got a call from work saying, we didn't think you were feeling well today. <laughs> <laughs> right? Which brings up the biggest message of all in terms of our media. Number one, and hopefully when we get started on the screen, I'll show you some of the cliches. Despite the fact that libertarians obviously don't have a lot of warm fuzzies about the media, right? They're not, we're not their favorite people, they're not our favorite people. We have to squash them. Whatever we believe in terms of how the media works, we have to crush that. We cannot leave with that. We cannot evidence that in our interactions with the media. We have to be professional. And most importantly, we need to understand that we have to sell ourselves to the media for them to cover us. What does that mean? Number one, we have to accept the fact that just because we're small people, and by the way, we're all right, all right, even in times of national emergency like this, they're not gonna find their way to our door. We have to create a value proposition for the media as to why it's interesting and important to cover us. It goes against the grain of everything, probably everyone in this room believes. But you know it's the truth. And no one in the media wants to hear whining about it. Because most of these people are underpaid, overworked, under the age of 25. No one cares about media bias, media conspiracies. These people are just trying to get through the day. Generally love their job. And if you actually try to pitch them and be positive, holy cow. One of the reasons why the Libertarian Party of Rhode Island was invited as a regular, oh, what do we got here? I only want to play this for you because So, I don't know if you can hear any of that? Yeah. Okay. So the point being, that's the state's official talking head show. You know how I got on that show about two or three years before that? I called them up and asked them. <laughs> we crazy, huh? I called them up and asked them. I spoke to the station president, all right, the head of the local, uh, at that point in time, they were truly, now they're actually included on privately financed. And I said, you know what? You just had a summit with all the state's political all the state political party chairs, except for one group you missed. 
Yeah, we weren't there. How come we weren't invited? But I said it in a friendly, joking manner. And I gave him three or four bullet points as to why we are interesting to have us on on a regular basis. Fiscal conservatism, uh, number one. Actually, we're better at being supporting human rights than literally any of the other parties. And that gave me a three-year run before I stepped down as chair, all right, to go in that. That was the head of the Republican and Democratic parties in the state. Didn't they look excited? They put on the spot. <laughs> Do you understand how much fun that was to say that to them? That their efforts aren't just voter suppression, they're disenfranchisement, they're, they're, they're being racist, they're being discriminatory. I got to say that, nice words, to all of them live on the air, and a good part of the state got to see them. radio guys, all right, if I can do this, there's no special skill to this. Presenting a value proposition to a media organization, all right, that's what it really comes down to. Why are we interesting? Why are we different? Why are we serious about what we do? That was a combination of a whole lot of protests, a whole lot of talk radio calls, a handful of newspaper articles, they hate us in the newspaper. NBC and ABC, CBS hates us, all right, for whatever reason, can't be they, right? But it, it, it's, that was the culmination of that. So number one, starting small, local talk radio. There's probably no better way to learn to hone your message than facing, if you will, the terror of the people. Okay? By doing that, creating a voice for that, being able to then work with that radio station for coverage. Then, as you become, take on local issues, and here's where the activism comes from, because you have to have something to talk about that people care. People cared about that damn baseball stadium, two of them. By the way, we are two for two. Twice in different cities, they attempted to impose on us $100 million plus tax subsidies on a state that's roughly the size of Staten Island. Right? Imagine that. And we were told, it's going to happen. Why are you wasting your time? They ended up in Worcester, Mass, $150 million for a private baseball stadium. That's already losing money. Whoa. <laughs> and I remind them all the time of how they were wrong. But the important part is we had a local issue that mattered. We were there on medical cannabis, a local issue that mattered. On a smaller niche level, of course, the, the war on sex workers, the war on drugs. We buttress that by testifying routinely in the General Assembly so that we're on a first name basis with a lot of our legislators. It's all part of the package. It all comes together. I have that press release, by the way. I think I'll put that up. So, there's two parts of this. And I know, I, can, I apologize, I'm all over the place because of this, because this thing. Press releases. Let's get back to them. Number one, tirelessly present press releases to every single member of the local media. To Chrissy's point, you don't need to spend any money. The act of actually finding out who's current will actually bring you into engagement with the media in and of itself. It gives you an opportunity for a few passive soft sells on why aren't you covering us. Call up your local NBC affiliate and say, hey, who's the press pass? Who's, who's the assignment editor? Who do I send this to? Oh, you email to this address. Oh, great. Hey, listen, I'm going to ask you. I mean, we're gonna we got something going on in about two weeks. Send it out in advance. We got a couple of coming up about two weeks. Think you sent someone by? Well, you need to send some press release. I know that. I know that. Listen, we'd be grateful if you sent someone by. Okay? You've got in here in the, con in the, in the structure of this, like I said, who, what, why, where. The why is critically important. We're all familiar with the term copy pasta, right? A significant number of the media, as short staffed as they are, do copy pastas on press releases. You put into that press release exactly what you would want them to print the paper, and sometimes it happens. You know, talk about mailing it in, right? <laughs> Literally. And that's why you have to send it in an electronic form. Send it in a JPEG and PDF. Sounds crazy, right? But for a lot of people, they aren't technical wizards. They aren't going to sit there and convert a PDF. It's easy to do copy pasta on a JPEG. Every single event. I don't care if that affiliate or that newspaper never sends a single person. 
all the time send them stuff. Because you never know that one day where they're going to have a reporter sitting around doing this with nothing to do. And they're finally going to say, oh, it's those poor, good poor bastards in the military party. They keep sending us stuff. Listen, why don't you go? <laughs> What happens when they show up your event? Critically important. It goes without saying, because we're structured for each in this party, right? We have a communications department, a comms department. Please call it a communications department. Don't call it. Don't, don't say two, two bad people. Don't call it a comms department. I know people like to do that. And number two, because it's unprofessional. Number two, when you open up a video or a podcast, don't say, hey guys. Please eliminate hey guys from your vocabulary. With us and all that. Take some work. Same here. When that reporter shows up, you treat them like gold. You don't want to do it. Hopefully, you've got your communication director or somebody you know who says hi to them, greets them by name, ask them if they want a press, a press release, or would you prefer that I send it digitally to you? Most of them don't. They've got a car seat full. I got a car full seat of printed out press releases that I've never looked at. Send it to them digitally. Again, giving them the opportunity on a short schedule to do the copy pasta. Then, when that day comes and they finally do a piece, don't cut and paste it and put it into your browser and then put it onto your site. Have a group of people ready to share the voters that way. Because newsflash, stuff that gets shared and liked that generates traffic, A, stays up on their website longer, and B, then, that's sort of a quid pro quo with local journalists. If all of a sudden they write a piece, and the, the, the editor comes by, hey, good job, buddy. <laughs> we got like 55 shares on this, and you know, 5,000 likes on a small town paper or something. That means something. That translates into business for them. Don't think that all of these reporters who have all sorts of responsibilities, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, I sat next to a Philadelphia Flyers reporter about a year or two ago. Not only does he have to write articles on Flyers, right? As if that's terrible. But he's expected to generate so many clicks on Facebook. It's part of his job. And also generate retweets and content views on virtually every social media platform. So you're actually helping them with their job. And that's what I call the media circle of life. Right? You, you, you make them look good. They've got a vested interest in covering you. And then what happens? All of a sudden, the community, how many extra people say, see your, your event? Because it's up on the page for an extra day. How many people attend the meeting because they heard about it on the local radio station when you were plugging a response to a hot button community issue? And you were the responsible one who actually addressed the issue. You answered people's questions without being asked. That reaches out and grabs people by the throat these days because there is so little credibility in the media these days in terms of individual, you know, and, and, and folks in the media. There seems to be so little honesty. Again, we have one advantage that we over everybody. We're right. And, and if we just find ways to polite, I'll, I'll, I'm here in New York, so I've got to use the Larry Sharp method, right? If we find ways to plant a seed, we're not arguing with people like everybody else. We're not insulting people like everybody else. We're planting a seed about our personally held belief system, statement of principles, and platform. That means something to some people. There is so little integrity. Okay, when? Where? Be as specific as possible. Who's going to be there? If you've got other local officials showing up, that's attractive to the media. Doesn't always happen, particularly when you're in your startup phase of, of generating your media. But that's what happens. So, like I said, this would turn out to be kind of a convoluted mess today, but I hope you'll bear with me. Um, let me play this. Again, getting back to the video. And I use that because the numbers were so dramatic, and it was so successful. And it was a coalition. Anytime any one single organization promotes legislation or an issue, it can be very easily identified as their ownership. We did this as a coalition of baseball stadiums. 
Republican Party in the state of Rhode Island decided to oppose truck halts. We have truck halts in total in Rhode Island. They made it a Republican issue. They thought that was a great idea. Guess what? Democrats were overwhelmingly voted against their stand because they made it a Republican issue. That's the level of politics and integrity in government today, right? Coalitions are everything. What does that say on the on, on a news organization that gets literally hundreds of thousands of views a month from the entire regional area? A small group of libertarian activists relentlessly advocated against almost any public financing for a private venture. Isn't that our message? We're looking for opportunities to hit people over the head with it. We do so through activism, and then following it up by, if necessary, for the time being, you're self-reporting on your activism and your promotion of said advertising. Everyone can do this. We've got people of incredible talents in this organization. But it requires commitment, it requires leaving your home, getting into that uncomfortable public space where you have to learn to, you know, it's a little bit like a hockey game. I'm a rugby guy. It's like a scrum at some of these legislative hearings. It takes that type of commitment. It takes time. It is not going to happen right away. It takes a professional attitude toward working with the media and working with them in the same way that you would hope you would be working with as a professional. It takes planting that seed, like Larry Sharp says. Planting that idea, understanding, again, you get the theme here, it's going to take a while. Does it happen overnight? In the case of certain of our successes as anti-government types in Rhode Island, we are literally a 15 or 20 year overnight success. It took us that long in the blue state of America, years of focus. But it was a lot of fun. We could see the gains. And one day I'm, I'm driving along and I turn on the local heart radio station and listen. And all of a sudden I hear, I think, what were the immortal words I hear from somebody I've never met? You know, well, Terry's got a, they got a point there. You know, there is no place for tax dollars in private investments. It makes no economic sense. It's theft. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my God, man, where were you?
Mr. Fishman taught me a very important lesson, by the way, for candidates. You ask for money not just because you need the money. You ask for money because you want people to feel invested in your campaign. It's like when you go out to that new restaurant, you're the first one there. You drop a deuce on it, right? You have the time of your life, right? And you, you <laughs> might have phrased that differently. <laughs> I knew that would get there. Yeah. But you, you, you're invested in that place. You go out and you promote the hell out of it. All right? You, you become an advocate for that. The same thing happens with candidates. People feel invested in you if they give you their money. You want people to be invested in you. Your first time around or so, you may not win, but you're building a brand. It's you in conjunction with the Libertarian Party. So join us on LPTV. TV. Reach out to me. I have a card over there. Friday nights, you know, we try to get as many candidates on. Listen, we're gearing up for a big year. 2022 is a important, important year for, well, for freedom. It's a critical year, not only for our country, but for the world at large. If we are now there, and, and I gotta tell you, nationally we're not. I mean, we need to come to grips with the fact that nationally we have advocated our role as the party of liberty and freedom on behalf of fighting and oppressive civil rights. So that doesn't mean gentlemen like this aren't making heroic gestures. But it's going to be up to the affiliate level to, to deliver that message. That's become clear. So let's get fired up. Please reach out to me if I can help. Any other questions?